Welcome to this episode of the New Space India podcast, a bi-weekly talk show that exclusively talks about India's space activities. The Chinese space program is perhaps the world's fastest growing space program at the moment. In 2018, China took over the US as a country that does the most number of space launches. and it looks like in 2019 they will hold the record for it as well also when you contrast the chinese space program against the indian one currently china has about six times more satellites which are operational in orbit than what we do in india i also get a sense that we in india understand more about the american space program or the european space program and the satellites and the missions that they fly against what our neighbor does therefore before exploring the evolution of new space in china I thought it would be a great episode to have a, an episode that talks about the foundations of the space program in China and how it has evolved in the last 60 years. Professor Chandrasekhar from the National Institute of Advanced Studies returns to the New Space India podcast to give us an overview of the Chinese space program, its beginnings, its acceleration and the future roadmap. I plan to record a future episode with a friend of mine who is deeply working with the Chinese new space ecosystem to contrast the episode here with that of the emergence of new space in China. Professor Chandrasekhar, thank you very much for agreeing to do yet another podcast episode with me. It's always a pleasure talking to you. Thank you very much for giving me an opportunity to to kind of tell you a little bit about what I know on space, which is not a great deal, but but some parts of it which I have been looking at recently. especially china would maybe of interest to many of your listeners yeah absolutely i think uh, there is uh, actually a very little cross section of people in the whole of the country who actually understand the chinese space program the architecture how it works or what are the current capabilities and i think this episode will set the foundation straight for people to actually get a foundation to understand how the chinese space program is structured against the indian one yes yeah. it would be nice to tell people what i know i've been doing a fair amount of work on it yeah so hope to share some of the insights that i have with everybody else yeah so let's it. start with uh, you know the very beginning the isro as we know it was a very civilian oriented space program starting with the idea of uh, space science or s- civilian applications So contrast this between how the space program in China started and you know the years of the beginning. See the space program in China actually has uh, its origins in the you know there is this very famous uh, scientist who used to work at Caltech called Chen. Okay he in a sense was uh, um, a student of Von Karman one of the pioneer pioneering aerospace uh, doyens. and he worked very closely with uh, von karman i think he was his most favored student and he was an advisor to the us government on a lot of stuff that was happening on the missile and the aircraft side as well as the missile side and also maybe the early days of the space uh, decision to go and look into satellites and 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 stuff like that so he was uh, he used to work uh, for the us state government uh during the mccarthy regime in the united states uh, because of his origins uh, he was accused of being a spy for china and he was victimized as uh, a spy uh, all his uh, all his positions and titles and all his thing was stripped from him and he became a uh, person non grata within the system i think in a deal that china had with the us uh, they agreed to send him back to china in exchange for some other uh, things that happened at that time so chen actually came back to the to the united i mean to china and in a sense you can argue that a lot of the chinese space program when he came back and he brought with him this conceptual and fundamental understanding of what are the major uh, technological as well as research problems associated not only with the aircraft but missiles and space and he was a kind of father figure uh, for the program even though the program actually was done by a lot of other very capable scientists many of them who had connections with uh, several parts of the world including the united states many of them came from europe um, some of them went to russia too uh, so the, the, the early days had a lot of people who did things but one would argue the visionary and the guy who advised the government in a big way on all space related as well as missile related matters was shen okay 
And so this was, uh, what was the time period? You said the McCarthy period? 1956 was? is the time he came back uh, to China. And uh, around 1956, the Chinese were looking to, uh, they had just one uh, kind of become a nation state. The PRC was founded in 1949. Okay. And uh, so they were looking uh, to use technology and science as an enabler for their development. And so around that time, there was a major formulation of a plan, a science and technology plan. And Chen had a major role to play in that plan. Okay. And he, in a sense, both for the Chinese Academy of Sciences, where he was a part of the academy system in China, as well as for the other academy that dealt with missiles called the Fifth Academy at that time. I think he was the guy who kind of coordinated, he was a part of both systems. And he's a kind of link between the, the, the technical and the military and maybe the political. He's a very key linking figure in the Chinese space and missile program. So you could say he was the Sarabai of China? Well, in a sense, he preceded Sarabai in a sense. I think the Chinese were ahead of us by a few years, maybe. Uh, he was also a very well-reputed, internationally acclaimed scientist. Okay. And uh, I think the fact that he was hounded out of the United States had a significant bearing. I don't think he ever went back to the United States after that. Okay, so this guy Chen comes back mm -hmm. and he's now in China. Yeah. And 1956. 56, he's 57, yeah. Uh, so Sputnik is launched. And immediately after Sputnik, the Chinese set up a system to try and look at uh, what they should do in terms of a satellite. Mind you, they didn't have anything else. They didn't have anything going at that time. They were still trying to build the requirement infrastructure. At that time, they were already talking of putting out another satellite. They were already talking about a manned mission in the 60s, as soon as, uh, you know, Yuri Gagarin went into space. So they've been looking at these things quite, quite uh, almost simultaneously with, with global happenings. Okay. And uh, the fact that they didn't have anything in terms of resources led them to go up and tie up with the Soviet Union. So they had a deal with the Soviet Union in those days, both for the missile part, as mainly missiles, and maybe they could have also got something in the space part, although that's not very clear. Okay, but the missile program clearly had a lot to do. Both the nuclear program and the missile program had origins in this early collaboration with Russia. So when it comes to China after the uh, 60s, for example, how was the establishment of uh, the entire capabilities for ground systems, launch systems and satellites established? See, the Chinese have, the Chinese have a system of, uh, see, they have a system called academies to start with. The fifth academy, for example, was the one that was identified with missiles. It originally started as a missile program. The space part of it actually originated in the Chinese Academy of Sciences. So they had a group of labs in China or uh, science academies in China that actually Chen pushed to do the space part. But, you know, China went through a lot of political upheaval, okay, so there was this great leap forward, which kind of screwed up the system, and then, of course, there was this cultural revolution, which further screwed up the system, like nobody's business, I mean, it was really a mess. And therefore, one of the things that uh, they had to do was to protect the requirements, both of the missile program and the, and the key elements of what they saw as strategic uh, requirements from the, from the cultural revolution. So there was this famous uh, general um, um, uh, who was a part of the long long march, right? And he was instrument. He he was responsible for the space and missile effort as well as the nuclear effort. He was responsible. So he took it upon himself in, to defend the program and to protect it. So a lot of the program came back under the folds of the PLA directly under the folds of the PLA, and they gave protection to these critical elements of the program. So during the critical days, especially both of the first satellite launch as well as the early missile program, the establishment was under a lot of pressure, right? Especially the operational establishments were a lot of pressure. I think even Chen was forced to become, uh, you know, was forced to confess and he went through some parts of these tribulations and a lot of the early guys, some of them even died because of the revolution. Okay. So they went through a fair amount of internal turmoil and it's only around the end of Mao's period right, uh, that things became a little bit more stable. Okay, 
So the period from say about 66, I would even say 60 down to about 76 was very turbulent. And the fact that the Chinese launched the first satellite during that time, the fact that most of their missile program had already become operational by that time, uh, talks uh, significantly of the kind of investments, the kind of uh, efforts they had to make to protect this nation program from the internal turmoil that was going on in China. So in my opinion, it's a very laudable and very extraordinary technological commitment. right? And many of those scientists seem to have uh, suffered a lot because of that. Okay. So because the nature of the Chinese program had a lot of interlink with the military, yeah. did the early days attract a lot of embargoes? Uh, or if it did, how did they overcome? See, the Chinese definitely had a problem with the United States. Okay, they were United States in the in the fifties and sixties certainly saw China as an enemy. The Soviet Union was seen officially by the rest of the world as as friendly to China, but you know there was a major difference of opinion between Mao and Stalin, and then between Mao and Khrushchev. Really. Never worked that way. So though they saw themselves as competitors for the power and influence over the. Uh, over the communist movement across the world. And China was competing directly with the, with the Soviet Union for that power. So Mao and, uh, and Khrushchev fell out very quickly. Okay, So around this early 60, maybe 1960 or 61, the Soviet Union withdrew all help and moved everything. In the interim, they had transferred a few missiles and a few capabilities to China. So the early missiles that the Chinese did was reverse engineering. There was a missile called the DF-1, Dongfeng-1 which is actually a direct uh, development of that. But the Chinese soon moved away from that and, you know, started building on their own capabilities. So the DF-2, the DF-3, the DF-4, uh, all of them are, you know, the DF-5, all of them eff effectively became uh, their own development, okay. So the period, I would argue, from the, uh, from the Soviet Union leaving, which was around 1960, till the period when the first satellite was launched, 60 to 70, was very critical and the space the satellite part of the program was kind of pushed away because you know and Deng himself was one of the guys who said we cannot do the satellite at this time so we will defer it so they put a lot of effort into the missile program the moment they had a missile that could that could do what it had to do i think the df3 and the df4 became operational then the idea of a satellite came back so around 66 67 the idea of a satellite and one once again became prominent and the first satellite was called, was launched in 70. And the political implications of this was substantial. Mao supported it okay, in a big way. The only criterion he had was to say that we should have the largest satellite in the world. You know, we should be bigger than the Russians, we should be bigger than the Americans. So I think the, the first satellite, it's called uh, Dongfeng Ha 1. Okay. Um, it's also translated into the East is red. Okay, that's the broadcast. That at 173 kg was the first, was the biggest satellite launch for the first time by a country. So there was a lot of political thing. Mao saw it as a, as as a political uh, thing to show that China is a powerful country in the world. So there has always been a very strong political motive behind both the space program as well as the manned part of the program. Okay, so it goes back to that time. How is the space program organized structurally with respect to the power structure? Because uh, in India, it was quite clear that uh, Vikram Sarabhai wanted control. Uh -huh. And so he essentially became, you know, the chairman of the space program, the secretary of the Department of Space, the chairman of the Space Commission, which even runs down to today's uh, same power structure. Yeah. Uh, how was it in China? See, I think the Chinese space structure is kind of different. See, the Indian space structure is largely individual focused. Okay, I mean, from my time, I know that Sarabhai, Baba was very well connected to the political establishment. He was on first name terms with the Prime Minister. Okay. Vikram Sarabhai also had very strong connections to the political system. Okay. During my time, Professor Dhawan also had pretty strong connections with the system. Although when he came, he didn't have it. He kind of grew it and it became important. So I would argue during the earlier period, the personal connections is important. In China too, it's not very different. Personal connections also matter. For example, Chen was very well connected with, uh, with uh, 
you know this uh, general right who was actually the the kind of father figure and he was very well connected with the political establishment so i think in the early structures they are very similar okay they are not very different it's largely personal relationships and i would argue that organizational relationships kind of grew out of the personal relationships and institutions kind of emerged practices emerged out of that kind of system so i would tend to believe their two systems are not very different except for one important difference the chinese space effort has always had a strong political and military component it's always had a very strong right i think the indian part has always had a very strong economic or a commercial or not even a commercial i would say a social component and that is one major difference okay between the two programs and uh, therefore the military direction to the space program has always been prominent okay and they have a significant say in a lot of things that happened in the, both in the early days as well as today even today it's not fundamentally very different I think the other aspects have become more and more important the military still calls the shots as far as the space program in china is concerned so let's talk about um, the institutions now we talked about a lot of the people involved uh, how are the institutions involved because in india you have you know the structure of uh, launch vehicle center with vsse shar being the launch pad isro satellite center doing all the satellites sac doing the payloads how is this organized within china see there are two parts we have to understand one is the functional part of building a satellite or a rocket and how that part is organized in the chinese system that's very much below okay in terms of the hierarchy it's much below and i would tend to believe the technological requirements are not very different the chinese had one different approach okay it's largely to do with the fact during the cultural revolution there were a lot of warring factions which were also warring to to get control over the space program so if you if you know your history right you know there was the shanghai group the gang of four largely based out of shanghai the beijing group a lot of the, te- the technological activity started the space program started around beijing okay as one of the major major centers for development so i think the fifth academy had most of it located in beijing and then you during the cultural revolution the shanghai group became powerful so in order to make the sur- program survive and in order to be able to do it the guys who were architects i talked about chen i talked about the you know the pla general and i talked about the pollard bureau shu and lai for example was a major major supporter of the space program so they had to make certain political compromises so the shanghai group in so for example china during the early days developed two different launch vehicles there was a fengbao launcher which was done by the shanghai group and there was the uh changzheng or cz launcher that was done by the beijing group okay now both of them used the same modules of the df5 missile the, the propulsion modules came from the df5 all the control elements that you need for all of it came from the df5 which had already been commissioned so you had these two parallel groups okay that were working in ta- parallel and creating capabilities in two areas at a time when china may not have had the resources to do everything you know without that so in a sense you can argue they created a competitive environment very early on not because they wanted to but because of political compulsions so today if you look at the organization they have something like nine of these academies i think they've actually divided that into two parts okay now if you look at the program today the capabilities of these academies which grew together have now divided under two companies one is the china aerospace sorry air it's called the casc china air and space and space and industry company okay the other one is called china air and space research company or a product company or something okay so there are these two companies casc and casic okay which are primarily the two major uh, components of this capability that has been created over a time so the academies in a sense have been split into two so you have two parallel entities both of them can do most of the things casic is actually largely devoted to the military component although they can do some civilian components also and casc can also do some military components but it's also largely devoted so at the working level there are these two huge consortiums 
very very big consortiums right and a lot of the academies a lot of the production capability a lot of the r&d comes under them so it's a kind of integrated conglomerate two competing conglomerates so the people at the top have choices they don't have to depend on one or the other i think the shengrao for example is done by parts of them i think some of the recent launches are being developed by casic they used to be earlier developed by cac and within cac for example there are two two two, two entities that can do launches calt is there and there's another sast which is a shanghai group they can also do launches i think the uh, chinese academy of sciences can build satellites so can uh, this company called cast aerospace china aerospace technology corporation that can also do that right so you have these uh, multiple capabilities today so they have a competitive environment internal competitive environment for both launchers for satellites for anything for example even the even if you want to do a shenzhou space kind of mission i think they they can create they can have two entities bidding for it and competing for it of course now the expansion into the industry and creating companies is also going on in parallel that's also another major thing that they have taken so in a sense you can argue that right now they are trying to emulate very similar or get as close as possible to a space ecosystem that is very similar to the united states so in that sense there was no consolidation among these two groups they still coexisted in some sort even to this day yeah yeah they coexist the decisions on who is going to do what is taken at the higher level and the higher level is a very it's complicated it's always been evolving and changing the it has evolved uh, progressively in terms of the challenges that china sees so chinese do a very good strategic planning kind of approach every 5 10 years or so they review what has happened and what is going on and they kind of make the changes that are necessary to do that so for example the early days of the program they had this committee for science and technology development for for defense science and technology for defense in the 60s that's the one in the early late 60s or just around the time when deng was trans- became important i think it became a uh, committee on science and technology for industry you know defense and industry so they've been changing around then they moved it out and they created a uh, they created a what is it called a government ministry okay so ministry of aerospace uh, you know technology i think it's called aerospace uh, industry masi or something and then they decided that they would create two, a huge corporation under that ministry okay and then they broke up that corporation into two entities which is what you see today so they separated the aviation out of the space business quite some time ago okay so all the so at one time it was aerospace industry ministry of aerospace industry then it became you know a space industry so it's kind of evolving and changing but one thing is very clear right it directly comes on so the, the chinese have three entities the politburo which is the political entity they have a state planning council which looks at the commercial and non part and they have a central military commission of these three entities are staffed by similar people politburo members and it's a very powerful entity so the cmc actually directly controls okay through a variety of mechanisms so they are what's called a leading standing group this is like a committee that looks at a po- so you want to look at agriculture for example you have a committee that looks at space and agriculture which tells you what it should be done it's like a number of advisory groups that are available that have the power to formulate a detailed plan based on the requirements of user ministries who are part of the state council as well as the supply side ministry which is you know the two companies that i'm talking about right all of them are represented there they're all coordinated in some sense by the pla okay so now they have reorganized so all there there used to be what are called these general staff departments right which used to serve as an intermediary between the between the cmc the central military commission and the working level uh, groups okay now they have abolished it and the cmc directly controls most of these entities how did the space program in china really scale up because you look at uh, what china did last year they've launched the highest number of uh, launches by any country which was 39 i think they beat the us last year and when you look at india we have slowly made those baby steps since 1993 when 
PSLV was successful, launched, and our program is still struggling to even beat the 10 mark every uh, year. So, how did China, you know, progressively scale up, and what was the efforts? How was it done? See, I think they've always had a very clear idea about scaling up. They've always, I think, the Chinese, generally, the Chinese programs have a significant component of scaling up built into it because they are looking at impact, right? And if you look at other areas also, they are, it's kind of inbuilt into the program. So I think they have clearly made the investment. See, post 2000, which was I think the 1990s, 2000, they decided on a major manned effort. Okay, it was a, they've always talked about a manned program ever since the days of Mao. They've always wanted it. But somehow it's been deferred because of capabilities, because of money, because of whatever it is. It always, but everybody, top political leadership, the scientific elite, all the, all the ministerial level political guys, all of them have had a clear idea that the man program is a must for China at some time or the other. So according to me, so this kind of a long term strategic vision is something that drives them. And they have very clear 10 year plans and 5 year plans. And they are very serious about reviewing it. Okay. And every year, for example, if you read any part of the program, communications or space science, they have a very clear program, very detailed, right? Whatever we see is only second hand, but I'm, I'm, it's very, from you can make out that they've gone through a very lot of detail. So it's worked out to meticulous level. It is discussed and debated at different forums. And then when it comes to the higher political level for decision making, it is decided, right? And they do this trade-off between, we used to do this in India too, during the planning commission, we used to do this part. And the planning commission was effective for a certain period in India when it put together this coordinated plan. So at some level, the, the Politburo and the, the institution under the Politburo and the state council and the CFC, they provide this integrating mechanism. Okay. And I think that they take it very seriously. Okay. And therefore, the question of scaling up is automatically taken care of. For example, in 2000, they decided that the military requirement was significant. Okay, so between 2000 and 2006, they did not significantly launch any major military program. In 2006, they launched their first log on satellite. Today, by 2019, they have 57 of them. They have launched 57 of them. These are remote sensing satellites? These are remote sensing, electronic intelligence. They do what is called C4ISR function. So C4ISR is one of the major requirements in order to make sure that, uh, you know, uh, opposition forces cannot land on China's shores. And incidentally, the core of China is also the richest part of China, the shoreline and the parts within our edges into the shoreline. So for that, one of the requirements is they have to target the enemy far away. You can't do this with land-based radars or land-based capabilities. You definitely need over-the-horizon capabilities. And satellites are very important for over-the-horizon capabilities. So they have understood this problem long ago. Okay. 2000 onwards, they made these investments. 2006 was the first Yorgon satellite. They launched the first electronic intelligence uh, triangular group of satellites around 2010. Right. So they have only they have 57 of them. They have many other military satellites. So they have a for constellation 48 navigation satellites. So they are replicating the American GPS. Okay, effectively. I think in the next year or so they will be completing it. Okay. They have a large number of SAR and EO satellites, electro optical satellites. So we have done a few studies. Okay, Taiwan, for example, is under electronic intelligence observation about 80% of the time. And if you can queue the uh, other satellites using the electronic intelligence satellites, this, this will increase to almost constant coverage. Okay, So they are very serious about their intentions of defending their coastline, defending their territories. And they see satellites in space as one important component of their architecture for war and deterrence. So the military part of the program, for example, is significantly expanded. Apart from the fact that they've done the manned program, Right. They've done the lunar exploration program, which is also a very big program. And, uh, you know, they have a whole string of navigation, remote sensing communications. And if you do a benchmarking exercise, they're not very far away from an American capability. I think they're still behind a couple of maybe one generation to one and a half, maybe two generations behind in some areas. 
but i don't see any other country as being close to the united states the only country that can challenge them is definitely the chinese yeah let's talk about uh, actually the civil military synergy or integration when china launched all of these satellites right from the beginning did they always have this uh, civil military synergy or it's it a new thing that they have dedicated military satellites and dedicated civilian satellites see the civil military integration actually started very very long ago okay i think mao himself was not interested very much in all that he saw space largely through a political lens or through a military lens and uh, you know he didn't see it in any other way i think the far sightedness of deng is what you should really appreciate he was the first guy i mean in a sense you can argue that he did what uh, professor davan tried to do in india i think tried to do i don't know let tell you but he said uh, you know not only should it be justified on other grounds he actually forced the economic agenda so for a period say between 1978 and 1990 till he left he pushed the he pushed the economic agenda and you know that economic agenda forced the chinese space program to look at other ways in which it could actually raise money okay so one part is a certain part of the production cap- capacities that was available in each of these major industrial centers and both these companies which effectively control they 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 were forced to make a lot of civilian products so all of them all the space pro- uh, companies and entities definitely have a civilian product group as well as a military product group i think it's kind of been built into the chinese system and i think it's one of the few places in the world where it actually happens in america for example a company that does military military things generally separates out because the value proposition is such that it is better for it to specialize in china for example because of the way in which it is managed and because of the support from the state in an indirect way these entities are actually held together okay so the capabilities for doing both civil and military and therefore the ability to use up the uh, the resources that it has in a much more efficient way has been inbuilt from deng's time i think with now all these new initiatives these things have been reinforced and in of course in china it's very difficult to know what is public money and what is private money so there are a lot of private companies i don't know whether the money comes indirectly through the government or whether they are privately come but now a lot of space companies are coming up which will develop both satellites launches and maybe all the value added services that go with the space program that's been given a big fill up as a part of the new initiative which looks at civil military integration So I think many of the missile capabilities are now being open to Chinese private companies. I think the Zhuk missile, the Zhuk launcher, which was recently launched, is derived from the Chinese DF-31, if I'm not mistaken. One of the hallmarks of the Chinese program is its ability to now export manufacturing capabilities of satellites and then providing services to other countries through trade. as a part of trade deals is this something as uh, a new phenomena that occurred in the last 15 or 20 years see I, i it goes back to the deng reform so the chinese needed to justify the program on economic grounds so one of the first things see when you look at the chinese capabilities and satellite building at that time they were very far behind okay but they had very good launch capabilities okay so the first thing they thought of was marketing their launch services goes back to 1988 or something when this great wall industries was kind of set up china great wall industries even today is there so they set it up okay and it was basically trying to hawk right uh, launch services to the market okay so they they even went to the extent of developing a specific because see the chinese uh, capacity for putting satellites in geostationary transfer orbit was limited because of their because of the cz the cz3 cryogenic capability had still not come into play it had not yet been developed so they actually configured another variant of the cz2c which had already developed and demonstrated to develop what is called the cz2e launcher now that could put about 2300 kilograms in geostationary transfer orbit which meant you could get about a 1000 1200 kg kg in geoso which was state of the art satellite at that time so in a 18 month period they actually developed this launcher and i think they sold a few launchers i think the first one that was sold was to australia they even did a test to show that it could be done so they actually put in a lot of effort into commercializing the launch vehicle services 
Now all went well, 1990s onwards, I think they did a reasonable job, they sold quite a few. And then of course, you know, the Soviet Union broke up, right? Uh, China and US kind of collaborated for a brief honeymoon period, right? And then of course the US decided that China was an enemy, right? And so they brought in all these regulations. So from about 1999 onwards, the Chinese had a problem because of the ITAR and the American restrictions. So any satellite that had an American part could not be flown on a Chinese rocket. Right? So that was, a, so I mean, I in one of the reports I have actually computed the kind of loss that the Chinese went through. Maybe a couple of billion dollars they lost just directly because of this. And then they decided that they would overcome that. Okay. So now they have a, so by this time they had a cryogenic capability that, you know, increased the capability. So I think the CZ3B, which is one of the vehicles, can put about 5,000 kg in GTO, which means a heavy satellite. Okay. So now they are on par. So their satellite building, communication satellite building is also kind of caught up. They bought a lot of satellites. They reverse engineered parts of it. They collaborated with Europe in a very big way. Uh, many European companies actually, uh, so they have now got a completely American component free satellite capability, right? That they can build with the Europeans if required, or they can build on their own. And now instead of selling it to them, they directly deliver it in uh, final orbit. They have sold about 13 or 15 satellites, 13 I think in the last count I have. So they have sold satellites to Nigeria, Laos, Bolivia, okay. Um, Belarus, Ethiopia, perhaps not yet, not yet. Maybe they will. Okay, well, not yet. They have Pakistan. Yeah, Pakistan has one. Um, so they they have managed to market this pretty well. Okay, and uh, the other thing they are doing is they are doing the same in remote sensing. They have sold satellites to Venezuela as another one. Venezuela has both the communication as well as the remote sensing capability. So. My point would be that they are now looking to supply, right, uh, reasonably close to state of the art, definitely at lower prices, delivery in orbit, no American parts. So the Americans may not be able to impose it. Well, I'm sure the Americans will find another way to do something about it, but right now it seems to be going reasonably well. Okay, so they, they, they have managed to overcome that and now they are reasonably uh, self sufficient. In, and if you look at the military satellites, their production capacities have increased significantly. So they've scaled up, uh, industrial scale up is well done, very well done. See, the Chinese have always been looking at hawking their capabilities. And I think they are the only company, only country that may compete with the US, for example, GPS. Right? I mean, navigation is a huge, huge, huge commercial market. I think the only standard that can compete with the GPS may be the Chinese system. Okay. Simply because they have a significant price advantage over both Russia and maybe over Galileo. Okay. So I would argue that uh, that is the one that will match, I think, the GPS capabilities. And it, they may give the Americans a run for their money. Although in balance, one would still favor the American standard to win. But I would argue that the Chinese will give them a big fight. Also, given that a lot of uh, electronics manufacturers will then be forced to use uh, the Chinese See, the contrary to popular impression, the Chinese semiconductor manufacturing capacities, even though they buy a lot, is pretty good. I think the world's uh, fastest supercomputers for a very long time was Chinese, right? And most of it is made out of indigenous chips. So it's not as though... See, they have devoted a lot of attention and time and money to catching up on semiconductors. So they are pretty much there. So I am not sure that, uh, you know, the American domination will continue. I think the Chinese are fairly close. The Americans are still ahead, but they are not. Chinese are not too far away. In critical areas, most critical areas of technology, I tend to believe they are there. Yeah. In a recent statement, uh, one of the former chairmen of ISRO talked about India having about 42 or 43 operational satellites. What does that number compare to the Chinese? The Chinese operational satellite number is. Uh, um, what was the number I had? 200 and odd. 270 maybe. Which are operational. Operational satellites. 100, 150 military satellites. Operational. 
So if you look at the manned space program as a military, which it is, okay, navigation as military, which it is, all the Argon satellites, which is military, which it is, some remote sensing satellites, which you can easily identify as military satellites. Um, it's a very large recoverable satellites, a lot of them in the early days, a lot of them. So I would argue that if you look at the record, I think out of 507 satellites that China has launched, 246 at least would be military. Right, which is about 50, 60, 55, 60 percent substantial. So that in terms of uh, budget would then mean they have probably four or five times the budget of the Indian space program? See, I've, never, I've not really done a comparison between the two uh, programs, but my point would be yes, it would be at least 10 times more, I would argue. Now again, you know, the comparisons in terms of money terms and all is very difficult to make, you know, power, purchasing power parity and stuff like that. But a significant, let me give you a manpower compare, that's easy. I think the Chinese missile program employed about 300,000 people. Okay, the space program employed at some time ago employed about 250,000 people. I think the Indian program, you put all the numbers together, industry, I'm not going to exceed 40,000 people. Right, so I mean, that gives you a, a fair amount of comparison. So I'm say five times to ten times plus. That would be more appropriate. So when it comes to the emerging space uh, security issues, um, especially after the 2007 Chinese ASAT uh, attack uh, of their own, putting out massive amount of de debris, uh, how has the whole space security scene uh, changed in China, especially also in terms of debris tracking abilities? I think the Chinese are doing. Uh, they are. See, they have got a couple of things which we don't have, right? One is what is called a tracking and data relay satellite system. See, that enables them to collect data from around the world and maybe also to keep track of where the satellites are from a space capability. So that's one thing that they're clearly doing. They have a reasonably um, robust system of tracking stations which do all the regular tracking, right? The problem for the military is you might have to do the skin tracking, which is, you know, it's not a, it, it doesn't radiate, so you have to do that. They have a network of radars and, uh, and, and optical tracking capabilities to do that. But the critical development that's happening today is you're putting things in space, right, so that you can actually look at, uh, look, use space to track objects in space, right. I think that I, I have not yet seen a clear reference in all the work that I've done on China regarding that, okay. But you know, if you look at a typical requirement for doing any rendezvous and docking in space, it's exactly what you need to do, right? So I tend to believe the Chinese definitely have assets in space, which enable them to look at other objects, both upward and downward, right? And locate other satellites and do that, okay? So I, I would argue that they are ahead of India on all those, on all those things, definitely they are ahead of India. And, uh, they have done a lot of these, uh, you know, maneuver, close rendezvous, right? Um, changing, shifting orbit, docking and docking with the space station many times. Okay. So they, all this is completely related to ASAT. Okay. They have a number of satellites in different orbits, especially some of them in six o'clock sun synchronous orbits that can do both LN and BMD kind of operations. Okay. So they have this new Yaogon 35 degree inclination constellation of alien satellites that significantly enhances their alien capability. So in a complete spectrum of what I call C4ISR, ASAT, BMD, okay, navigation, right? Uh, all the ground related stuff that goes with it. Okay, they are completely, uh, I would argue, self-sufficient and maybe scaled up to the requirements of an operational capability. From again a regional geopolitical standpoint, uh, do you think a lot of the navigational and communication as well as remote sensing capabilities uh, from China, from all these network of satellites, is up for sharing with uh, Pakistan very openly or? I think they will give them everything, no question. See, the China is very clear in its alliance with Pakistan. It is directed only and only against India. I mean, there's no ambiguity about it. We have done, uh, you know, work in, in NIAS where we have established very clearly, okay, 
by measurements of missiles and corresponding missiles and Pakistan's missiles, clear transfer of technology. Okay, the nuclear test that uh, you know Pakistan did. The first test is a Chinese test replicated in China in the 60s. There is a there is a lot of literature which says that uh, Pakistan actually tested a device in Lopnor in the 19 in 1990. There's a lot of documentation. The evidence clearly matches yields and stuff like that, so it looks quite probable. And the so I mean there has been help on the nuclear side. There has been help on the missile side. The Pakistan satellite, uh, you know, the Pakistan remote sensing satellite launched last year or this last year is Chinese again. It's made in China and uh, supplied to Pakistan. They also have a Pakistan satellite launched along with that. The, pa the Pakistan communication satellite is, is built by China and delivered in orbit by China. My point would therefore be that uh, clearly China and Pakistan are in a strategic alliance. Now, the extent to which China will support Pakistan through thick and thin is debatable. Okay, I don't think they will do all everything, but they will do whatever it takes to make sure that India is kind of fixed to the extent that they can fix it. Okay, so that's the reality. And wishing it away is wishing it away. The hard technical reality based on these assessments is something you cannot afford to ignore. So while you have all these political judgments on how you want to negotiate, I think the hardcore aspect of this, and I, I don't see any abatement in this, uh, in this, uh, it, it has become stronger, I feel. And the critical components and parts that uh, Pakistan may need for anything that it wants may also be going from China. We cannot rule the top. Okay. What is uh, China's perspective on, um, you know, the asteroid mining issues like this, which are emerging largely from the West? Are they even looking up to it or will they say this is not for private companies uh, so is a subject of the state or see politically they would they would go they would tow a line which is similar to India which is a kind of anti privatization line okay there I think India and China may, may not be very different and I think it's largely because of the historical aspects. See, again I come back, it doesn't matter what you think or what your ideological groundings are. What matters is power, right? the ability to do that. The Chinese have clearly recognized that power is important. I think India to some extent is also recognizing that power is kind of important. So if the world is going to do that, the Chinese will also be doing that. Okay? I, my personal opinion based on what I know is this mining stuff is potentially possible today. It's doable. Technologically doable. I'm not sure about commercial viability. And maybe we are putting the cart before the horse and trying to do all that. I still think there are many, many problems that need to be resolved. And economics is also going to be dependent on exploitable resources on the ground, right? And to what extent, uh, you know, cost effective space thing. There are some requirements which can maybe only be met by space. I think those will become viable. And when those happen, um, then we'll have to see. But I'm not very comfortable with all this mining of asteroids, rich asteroids. The economics doesn't make sense as far as I'm concerned. Right? Demonstration, capability building. I, I, the legal regime will go where power goes. Because all legal regimes are what I call the consequences of legitimizing a power structure. Going back actually to the ASAT uh, test. Uh, what are the current counter space capabilities of China which are non-kinetic as in not just crashing in a missile into a satellite? I think they would do a lot of jamming, right? Simple jamming, radio jamming is one area. Space-based? Right? Space-based, ground-based. You can jam a satellite by sending another satellite which is closer, right? And it can be jammed. They will also do things like uh, cyber related stuff because if you can, for example, the Americans have two satellites in geostationary orbit. Maybe the Chinese also have one, we don't know, right? We need to monitor it a little bit more. They, what that does is it goes above the geostationary orbit and below the geostationary orbit, okay? It can monitor all the radiation that comes out of it. It can figure out how the command and control works, right? And if you can figure that out, you might be able to access it, right? And be able to do a lot of that stuff, okay? So there are many methods of not doing ASAT. But let me repeat again, ASAT is the one established hard kill option. Okay, it's the one that everybody knows will work. So you want to deter somebody, maybe that's the only thing that will deter somebody who, who thinks it will work irrespective of that. 
But that said, there are many other ways of doing it. Now, laser-based stuff, uh, I think, can damage satellites today, but ground-based lasers are not yet powerful enough. And space-based lasers, are, you need to carry a lot of weight if you can do that. Uh, you know, the American laser that was carried on a, on a large plane, a Boeing, one of the Boeing planes. I mean, you needed the whole plane. Uh, one is not sure it's going to work, so the Americans have called off this, you know, boost phase defense, right? It's not going to work. So I think BMD and ASAT and SSA and HELINT and EO surveillance, they're all closely kind of linked, right? You need to look at the totality rather than looking only at pieces of it. I would argue that the Chinese have got enough capability to deter that. If required, they can do preemption too. Right? They can go all the way up to jurisdictional orbit. One of the things that made a lot of news in the last year or so is actually the quantum communication satellites yeah. and uh, the Chinese demo oh. of this. How significant it is, uh, and then you know how are we even working towards it in India? See the Chinese. I told you about Chen and the Chinese Academy of Sciences. See the Chinese Academy of Sciences has a long history. I think during the during the Cultural Revolution, it lost a lot of its power. Okay, I think when uh, Deng left and you know China became richer and it became more concerned about what was happening elsewhere, it also sought political prestige to show that it was a big economic and political power in the making. So the MAN program actually came out of a Chinese Academy of Sciences uh, kind of recommendation. There's this 860 program which has a lot of inputs from the CAS also, which kind of talks about a lot of these things. Okay, And so the MAN program actually came out of all that. And the other thing that the Chinese were pushing, the CAS was pushing, and different parts of the CAS actually, is the ability to do some state-of-the-art kind of thing. Okay. So the Lunar Exploration Program, which followed the MAN program, was the next politically important project, which also came out of a CAS initiative. Okay, so from 1990 onwards, when you look at the trend, the CAS, which had significantly lost and lost power to the, the commercial part maybe, or to the military part maybe, is now becoming much more prominent. And as I said, if you look at the CAS strategy document, the Chinese Academy's uh, sciences. They have a strategy document for space. It's worth reading. It's a very good document. They have clearly laid out a set of, plan, of programs. And if you look at the record, see that Chinese had a program with the, with the with the European Space Agency for something called Double Star. The, so this is really about looking at the sun and its impact on the Earth, right? Especially all the disturbances that happen on the Earth and the environmental kind of things that can happen to communication and all that. So one area they have identified, near proximity, which has not only the space operational implication, but also ground, very clearly the double star program and all that. They had a grandiose plan to do a Mars exploration and they collaborated with, uh, with Russia, I think. And one of their Mars satellite missions was launched on a Ukrainian rocket or a Russian rocket, I don't remember, but it failed. Okay, so they kind of scrapped that and then they went with the Lunar, which was largely their own kind of program. And they are now looking for a change. Now, they don't want to be followers, which is what they've been doing. Clearly, in the last five years or the last seven years, if you look at the CAS strategy document, they are looking at being the first in the world to do certain things. Okay. So, the quantum communication satellite that they did was one of the first things. It's directly coming out of a CAS kind of initiative. The other one they did in 2016 was this X-ray pulsar satellite. The first satellite that looks at X-ray pulsars for time measurement. Okay, So it not only has deep space implications and research implications, it can also be used for deep space navigation. Right. So they have uh, the other one they did was uh, they have a lot of collaboration also with the French. They have this uh, ocean satellite, uh, CFOSAT or something. Huh? China France Ocean Satellite. So they are they are doing a lot of collaborative activities in addition to what they are doing on their own. Okay. So they had this hard X-ray modulation telescope also launched last year. So there are a large number of science initiatives. So they want to be a leading player in science. So we are looking at citation index and papers, you know, all these measures. I think mean, the Chinese are trying to game that system, they're trying to be. So many of these ideas are American, but the Chinese are the first to actually uh, 
kind of give it shape and actually do it for the first time. Nobody had launched a quantum communication satellite, right? Nobody had done an X-ray pulsar satellite. So they are on the first of its kind. When it comes to the human space program aspects, uh, they have now worked on two space stations and then now there's a concrete plan of building a larger third major station. Do you think uh, the the plans of them stepping onto the moon is uh, something that is viable in the, in the next decade or so? See, in order to go to the moon with a man, they need a larger rocket. I think the CZ-5 is the largest rocket they have. It can put about 24 tons in low Earth orbit. Okay. I don't think that may be enough. I'm not sure. Okay. Now, to send something all the way to the moon and to be able to land it on the moon and bring it back. I think they are talking about the development of a new launcher also. So, at some stage, the lunar program and the manned program is likely to get integrated. And the most likely target is likely to be the moon. Okay. But I'm not sure 10 years is reasonable. 20 years. 2049 is the 100th year of the PRC. That may be a target. Maybe 10 years earlier, it can be done. They need a new rocket. So if you assume about 7 or 8 years or 10 years, 15 years is reasonable to expect that to happen. 10 to 15 years. Not before that. I don't think they have yet got any uh, clear, at least the public uh, open source data doesn't tell us anything about the new launcher. But they have to develop a bigger launch vehicle, I feel. Yeah. They want to do it in a reasonably large scale. There's a lot of new Chinese activity in terms of a lot of traditional space employees of China under the Chinese government who have now, you know, voluntarily retired and started to work as private entrepreneurs. This was on the fact that in 2014, the Chinese government made a policy that it would allow Chinese space entrepreneurs to step in and farm companies and from the news that I have been following I hear about 80 to 100 companies uh, being formed during this period of time and potentially more than half a billion dollars of investment raised for these companies over time. Uh, do you think this system of the new generation of private entrepreneurs are in conflict with the state system or do you think the state will allow them to operate? I think China will be clearly what I call a top-driven government-controlled uh, environment. Given that, I would still feel that yeah, they will create a, they will create an ecosystem that may not be the American ecosystem, but it will be a very similar ecosystem. Or you know, uh, I tend to believe they do believe that private initiatives will be important, and they would they will definitely create a parallel ecosystem to the U.S. Okay, I mean, I don't see any reason to doubt that. Based on whatever structural features I've seen, and not only in the space thing, but even in rare earths, for example, they will create an ecosystem that is competitive at every part of the value chain, right? And it may be state controlled and state directed. I'm not trying to say it may be even state financed, but it will be competitive, it will be dynamic, and it will be evolving. Okay, I don't see any reason. See, the Chinese model is it's wrong to compare a Chinese model with an American approach. I, I tend to believe. I think the Chinese have got a system which is reasonable. It may not be economically very efficient, but if you look at it from a social point of view or from a larger development perspective point of view, I tend to believe maybe it's more it's more efficient, right? And it's more what I call society serving, right? So I am not sure. And I think over time, given the R&D investment that China is making and creating a lot of competitive capabilities, maybe they will be at the forefront of uh, change and innovation too. You cannot rule it out. Although I think it is difficult to mimic the American innovation system, but the Chinese may also be able to do that. We cannot rule it out, I feel. I mean, I don't see any logical reason why we should rule it out. Do you think there's a lot of benchmarking of the Chinese capabilities against the current Indian military capabilities, which is effectively being done in India at the moment? Because from, from my sense, in India, there is the civilian space program that is acting sort of independently and trying to satisfy some of the military requirements. But we have essentially three or four military assets up in place apart from the navigation satellites. So do you think in the system in India, we are really thinking of a very technically driven military integration of space? According to me, we are very far behind, very far behind. 
See, I did an assessment of the military requirements for the Indian program in 2015. I had estimated at that time we needed to scale up about 10 times, seven, five to seven times. That's not correct. I think we are now going into a manned program, which is going to take away a significant amount of resources and capability. And therefore, I think somewhere we have to give, uh, you know, on the, unless we create an industrial capability, which is able to expand capacity in a significant way, or unless we are able to create another ISRO, for example, somewhere else, we have to do a trade-off between, you know, different, see, if you aspire to be a world power, right, you cannot ignore the fact that you also need to be a significant space power. And while it has a political component like a man in space and, you know, an ASAT test, it's also got a significant military component. Like I need to know what's happening in space. I need to be able to find out what other people are doing in space, right? Which I think are much more fundamental kind of issues. So you need uh, SSA, you need C4ISR, you need military navigation capabilities that are state of the art, not some things that you can do just because you can launch satellites. So you need to be state of the art. So my point would be, therefore, that you need a significant scale up of the of the space economy, right? I don't see any thinking along those lines. And you need a significant investment in industry. You cannot create, in my opinion, today it's far fetched to create another ISRO. Another ISRO should emerge in, uh, you know, a consortium of industries rather than in ISRO itself. So we need a significant, I, I would argue, maybe ten to twenty times scale up in terms of industrial capabilities and I don't see much direction along that way. Yeah, I am very skeptical whether we can do that in the next five years or so. So far the Indian space program has actually taken an independent perspective to building a roadmap and only now we see the emergence of the human space flight program and many other new things that uh, were not there before. Do you think that the influence of the Chinese space program and the growth of the Chinese space program has had an influence on the decision making on the path of the deviation from the Indian space program from the civilian context as in the economic integration context to more of the human space flight aspects? I don't know. My argument is the country is going through a major relook at itself, right? I think in India, the India that I grew up in was a different India. We were a very relatively weak economic uh, power. And a large part of what we did was basically trying to do something different that enabled us to be able to bring some value to what we thought was important, which was societal needs, right? meeting societal needs. I think the perceptions of, of India, Indians about India itself is kind of changing. I think there's a, there's a lot. So now people are aspiring with the economic growth led kind of stimulus, people are aspiring for India to become a more dominant player in the world, which I again think is not a bad aspiration. I mean, I don't see why we should think we are not as good as everybody else. So I think that aspect one would accept. The question is, what do we do about it is the more important question, right? And where do we put priorities in terms of what we want to do? I think we are also being driven by what the Chinese are doing. I'm not saying we are not completely independent of that. But we seem to lack a clear idea of what is it that we need to do in order to meet what we think are our aspirations, right? Is our aspiration to make sure we grow economically? Is our aspiration that we, we become a political power through the exercise of a man in space, or what I call soft political power? Do you want to be a hard power through the military capabilities that you want to do? You have to make some choices, right? My point is not all of them have to be trade-offs, right? But you need a combination of these capabilities that has to be weaved into a kind of medium and a long-term strategy, right? We lack that. My argument is we are doing things piecemeal as and when it's dictated by a particular situation rather than having a strategic long view. The greatness of Satish Dhawan was the fact that he took the long view, right? I think it held well till about 2000. We seem to be drifting since then, right? So my point would be that we need to correct the drift, we need to get our act together if we want to make any sense out of this. We have capabilities, there's no doubt that the ISRO is strong. I tend to believe that many DRDO capabilities are also very strong. We can build whatever is needed. Apart from the military, the economic side is, is waiting. I mean, the remote sensing applications themselves are huge potential. If you combine them with navigation and communication, you can create all kinds of systems. Right? 
So my point is there's a whole big world of opportunity. I don't know whether we have the internal capability to seize on that opportunity and, and realize an India that we think should be now. I want to end the episode on a high note. So I would like to ask you what would be the recipe for India to follow in the next few years where we could kind of be on par with most of the other space bars? I think one of the first things we need to do is to create a viable space industry in India. Okay. Which means that space expertise and knowledge must become more widespread. I mean, I'm talking about ability to build satellites and rockets, which is grassroots kind of capability. And more importantly, ability to use space capabilities, which is again, a lot of value addition. And a lot of it is high tech. A lot of it is driven by information kind of things. And uh, they involve complex arrangements and organizations and architectures to be able to do that. I think we need the for space capabilities to diffuse more broadly into Indian industry. Also into Indian administration. Many people don't know enough about it. They think it's a black box. You know, nobody knows. We need more people who are savvy. So they decide what is to be done, what can be done, what cannot be done. I feel top level decision making in India doesn't have a good idea what can and what can be done through space. I think that is also something that we need. We need to know what is happening in space. I mean, even to make informed choices, we need to make a lot of investments to make sure we know what is happening in space. Now, this calls for hard investments. It calls for a lot of investment in human resources capabilities. We need at least maybe 20, 30 entities in India which are looking at what, you know, if you look at American, uh, if you look at the American system, there are a number of people in different walks of life who put out all kinds of stuff on what's happening and they do it, you know, it's incremental. Most of the stuff you learn about military space comes through them. I mean, because none of it is in open source. So they do a lot of things. So we need to create, you know, that kind of, uh, you know, uh, you know, Professor Dhawan used to talk about it a lot, but unfortunately, I don't think he could <laughs> ever realize any part of it. It was like that. But see, so the other thing is you need to create that kind of awareness. I think we need a reorganization of the way uh, the military, the civilian, and the political are integrated. Okay, my argument is the political and the economic and the military have to be integrated in a better way. So my point is, should we have only one ISRO? I tend to believe we should have, if you look at China, if you look at the US, they have several kinds of ISROs around. I think the time has now come when we need to create parallel competing entities, right? And we have also reached a scale. So with industry and with this kind of system engineering capabilities that are outside. So we need a military system engineering. We need one civilian system for engineering. Maybe we need industrial consortiums that can do parallel and propose things to the, to the entity. So these guys, so we need a lot of structural change. And I think without those structural changes, this transition, the scale up is going to be a problem. Let's hope that uh, these things work out in the future. And uh, thank you very much for spending an hour talking to me. Mm -hmm. It's always a pleasure talking to you. Thank you very much. I hope people find it useful. Thank you for staying until the end. If you have any comments or suggestions, please write to curator at newspaceindia.com. Please consider sharing this episode with any friends or family who may be interested in learning about India's space activities. If you would like to stay in touch with the New Space India community, please use the link in the description to join the New Space India Telegram group. Feel free to also suggest guests for any future episodes. A new episode of the New Space India podcast is released every other Friday. Do subscribe to the podcast using Apple, Google or any other podcasting platforms you may use.